Hello everybody and welcome back to Oxygen Not Included. If you play the game long enough, you've probably run into a situation like this where the top half of your base is all nice and oxygenated and the bottom half of your base is an unbreathable pit of carbon dioxide. And you think to yourself, this pit of carbon dioxide is getting bigger, I should probably do something about it. And today we are going to showcase eight methods of doing something about it. The first one is not really doing much about it, but it is an answer, at least for a time, and that is to simply dig your base deeper. Carbon dioxide is a very heavy gas, heavier than pretty much every other gas in the game except for ethanol gas and gases made out of metals, which are at really high temperatures. And so uh, in a normal base, it will sink to the bottom, assuming you have kind of enough airflow going on between the areas of your base and the bottom of your base. And so simply by expanding out the basement of your base, expanding out the bottom area of your base, you can give more area for that CO2 to settle and provide more areas in your base that are going to be filled with nice, clean oxygen. This only solves the problem for a time, but it is viable and is probably what you want to be doing at least in the early stages of the game. You aren't in, particularly in a rush to solve this CO2 problem until it really starts getting out of hand. Once it really starts getting out of hand, you're probably going to want to switch to one of these other seven methods that I'm going to detail here. And the first is the most straightforward one, and that is simply a carbon skimmer. A carbon skimmer is a small little 2x2 two two building. It only consumes 120 watts of power. It takes in clean water through an input port right here, and outputs polluted water through an output port right here, and deletes up to 300 grams per second of carbon dioxide. To put that in perspective, that is a lot of carbon dioxide. A single coal generator, when operating, will produce 20 grams per second of carbon dioxide, and a duplicate will only exhale two grams per second of carbon dioxide. So an operating carbon skimmer is equivalent to 15 coal generators or 150 duplicates. That's a lot of stuff. You really need a lot of big industrial processes producing a lot of CO2 to kind of justify a carbon skimmer, but it is a very direct and simple answer. And here we've built a little setup just using a coal generator, a smart battery, a water sieve, and then four carbon skimmers. The coal generator generates 600 watts of power. The water sieve and each of these carbon skimmers only consume 120 watts of power. So this is a nice little compact system that can potentially delete 1.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide per second. That's more or less one tile of CO2 per second. 600 seconds in a cycle, you're going to delete a lot of the carbon dioxide in your base really quickly. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The main downside of it is that you're not really getting anything out of this process. You're just deleting the CO2. And so we have a couple more processes that actually get you something in return. First off are oxyferns. Oxyferns require carbon dioxide to grow, but they produce oxygen in return. They don't have the same throughput of a carbon skimmer. Uh, an, an oxyfern that has been put in a hydroponic farm tile or normal farm tile that's being delivered, having water delivered to it, will delete 0.67 grams per second of carbon dioxide. So you'll need three of them just to keep up with a single duplicate. But the flip side is they generate oxygen for you. And basically in the same ratios that your duplicates breathe, breathe in and breathe out, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So three oxyferns will take care of all the carbon dioxide generated by a single duplicate. They'll also provide all the oxygen for that duplicate. You will need to make sure that these oxyferns have some connection to your base, that they, there's a way for CO2 to fall down to these oxyferns and oxygen to rise up. Having a nice wide uh, staircase like this, a nice wide stairwell for gases to pass through is pretty important when putting these at the bottom of your base, but you are getting something out of it. And really the only cost for these oxyferns is a little bit of water. Here I've set up some hydroponic farm tiles with the oxyferns, and then I simply have a pipe connecting to these oxyferns. Algaetoriums are a little bit different. Algaetoriums are what you would be using on a map that isn't uh, having a forest biome start like these oxyferns uh, would be provided in. Here we have sort of a plains biome start and instead of oxyferns you're given algae. And algaetoriums don't require CO2 to grow, but they will delete CO2 as a sort of byproduct of their oxygen generation. So if you put them in a CO2 loaded environment, they will be able to delete a little bit for, for you. Like the oxyferns, they don't delete a whole lot of it. You basically need six of these algaetoriums to keep up with the carbon dioxide production of just a single duplicate but they are pretty simple and they are giving you something in return. Here we have a little setup where we're taking advantage of the fact that algae terrariums don't necessarily need the water that uh, is required for their operation supplied to them by duplicates. You can instead just pipe it in and they will suck it up off the ground that they are planted on. So here we have these algae terrariums and we have a liquid valve and a liquid vent. 
And by pumping water in through here, we can control with this liquid valve how much water is being deposited in this algae terrarium area and set the value of this liquid valve equal to however much water these algae terrariums are consuming. And that's just gonna be determined by uh, how many algae terrariums we have. We'll still need to have duplicates be able to access this area because they will need to come in and deliver algae to the algae terrariums and also remove polluted water as it's generated by these algae terrariums. That's not that big of a deal. Um, but keep in mind that these buildings can also be used to delete CO2. They're not just for oxygen production. Here, method number three, we have a slickster ranch. Slickster ranches are probably the most useful thing you can do with your carbon dioxide because the slicksters will turn it into uh, crude oil in the case of normal slicksters or petroleum in the case of molten slicksters. And crude oil is a very valuable fuel. You can take this crude oil and turn it into either petroleum or natural gas, both of which can run in generators. And in running them through generators, you'll generate not only more CO2 to feed your slicksters, but you'll also end up generating polluted water for your base. And water is a very crucial resource in this game. It's usually the backbone of a lot of your food and oxygen production. So being able to produce oil out of your CO2 ultimately means you're able to produce water out of your CO2, which is a very important thing. Slicksters, will consume 333.33 grams per second of CO2. That's basically what their standard diet is, assuming you know they're in a normal part of their lifespan, they're happy, all that stuff. And that basically equates to one Sixter Ranch like this of 96 tiles. Here we have set up a little 96 tile Sixter Ranch with six Slicksters in it, which is the capacity for a 96 tile ranch will be able to supply the carbon dioxide deleting needs of 10 duplicates. Typically, you want to pair these with a more industrial process because you'll end up having a lot of Slickster ranches, but even just one Slickster ranch like this can, can deal with the CO2 that's being generated just by a small base of 10 duplicates. So um, this is a great answer for your CO2. This is ultimately what, what you want to move to. The big downside of Slicksters is that they are born at a temperature of 95 degrees Celsius. And so over time, this Sixter Ranch is just going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And Sixters themselves are kind of resistant to cooling, uh, partially because they just actually have a very large specific heat capacity, um, but also because they die if you cool down their environment too much. So the big downside of a room like this is that the temperature that you're going to have to maintain it at is gonna be fairly high, and also it's gonna be generating heat over time. So keep that in mind before you set up a Sixta Ranch. Certainly before you position a Sixta Ranch anywhere, there is going to be some need for insulation between this area and the rest of your base. The other four methods are all methods of storing carbon dioxide, and this is valuable for a number of reasons. One, because you might not have found Sixters yet and ultimately wanna feed all your CO2 to Sixters, so storing it for the time being might be a good step until eventually you find the Sixters, get your Sixter Ranch up and going and start getting petroleum out of it. Or you could decide that you wanna use the CO2 later as a form of venting gas, that ultimately this is gonna be something that you dump a lot of heat to and then vent into space. This is something that a lot of other people do to manage their heat problems in the base. And so we have four different, uh, ranging from non-exploitive to mildly exploitive technologies for storing your CO2. The first and most straightforward one is simply a gas pump attached to a gas reservoir. Gas reservoirs will handle 150 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which is a pretty good amount, and gas pumps will pump up to 500 grams per second through a gas pipe. So on each level that you have as you dig down in your base, you can just set up this little gas pump gas reservoir system, and as long as there's CO2 in the area, have it pump into the gas reservoir. You can just go ahead and manually toggle on and off these gas pumps depending upon where the CO2 layer has ended up in your base. You could add, if you want, a gas filter to this system. I have a number of gas filtration technologies that I go over in my electrolyzer video, or you can just simply have it all dumped into a gas reservoir regardless of what it is. You'll get mostly CO2 as long as it's at the bottom of your base and not much of anything else. So this is a pretty uh, sound method for going about this uh, carbon dioxide storage. Another method it is that you simply dig out a large area and then install a high pressure gas vent. A high pressure gas vent will be able to pump CO2 into a room so long as that room is under 20 kilograms per tile of pressure. So this is actually a pretty good amount of CO2 that you're able to fit into a room. 20 kilograms per tile is kind of up there with the 150 kilograms that comes with this gas reservoir, right? And you can in fact combine the systems. You could have a gas reservoir in this room that you're pressurizing with carbon dioxide and have all the, the overflow from that gas reservoir simply go into the room. High pressure gas vents do require a little bit of plastic though. So they are something of a later game technology, but they work quite well. And finally, we have two somewhat exploitive methods. The first is what I might call a heartbeat pump. 
The basic idea here is that we have two buffer gates and a NOT gate connected to a little Atmos sensor or anything that's going to send a signal. And these are being used to open and close this mechanized airlock. On top of this mechanized airlock, we have a large body of crude oil. And so what happens is every time this door closes, it forces out the crude oil and puts it up into this little corridor that we have up here. And then the door opens again. It's filled with CO2, but then that CO2 gets pressed upwards by the falling crude oil and pumped into this room. This allows you to overpressurize a room to whatever pressure you want. You can, so you can store an infinite amount of CO2 in this room if you really care to. So this is a very powerful method for storing things. You know, another important feature of it is it requires no power. This mechanized airlock does not need any power supplied to it in order to operate. If you supply power to this, then potentially you could operate the system faster, right? Because it'll open and close faster. But with, for no power and just a little bit of area, this doesn't even need to be that large because again, you can store any pressure of gas in this area. You can have yourself an infinite CO2 storage area. Um, to go over the automation just a little bit, because this might be confusing for people who haven't worked with the sort of logic gate systems of this game before, we're going to go to the automation, automation wire. We have a buffer gate up here that's been connected to this Atmos sensor just like this. It connects to this NOT gate, right? These ports just go straight down across here, and then we have another buffer gate. Now, this buffer gate is set to 9 seconds. This timing will be different if you're powering your mechanized airlock, and this buffer gate is set to 5 seconds. So basically what's happening is this is going on a loop of every nine seconds sending a signal, and then this is sending uh, every four seconds a signal to this, this mechanized airlock. And so oh, it's basically toggling between four seconds on, five seconds off for this mechanized airlock, and that's roughly the timing that you need to have this kind of work smoothly. Any shorter of a timing, and there won't be a long enough time for this animation to complete on the mechanized airlock, and therefore it won't completely open or won't completely close depending upon which way you've, you've set things. Now, if you power this mechanized airlock, then it's a different story. Uh, these timings will become shorter because it will open and close faster, but this is a working system for this. And there are other ways of doing this sort of clock circuit that we have right here. But this is a pretty straightforward one. You can see it in action. Uh, this is a sort of standard one that a lot of people use. The other usual technology for doing these sort of circuits uh, basically just involves filter gates. So it's pretty much the same idea if you understand what a filter gate does and a buffer gate, um, just a little bit reversed, right? But just to review that again, so you can copy it for yourself. Automation wire, just like this. One straight down across here. Another one linking between your signal source uh, and these two, uh, this buffer gate and this not gate right here, and then finally the output coming out of your bottom buffer gate right here, or your shorter time circuit buffer gate. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and this again will store an infinite amount of CO2, and one of the things I also like about it is that this Atmos sensor uh, can be set to control whether or not the system is active. So if you decide, I just want to re reduce the pressure down to a certain point, you can set in this Atmos sensor where you want that point to be uh, uh, set at. So here I say, I want you to keep on pumping CO2 into this room until the pressure has been reduced to two kilograms. I could set this lower, I could set this higher. Depends on what you're trying to achieve with your gas pump down here. This isn't the fastest process, though of course we could have just replicated this entire thing across this entire layer here, right? We could have multiple doors opening and closing all in the same sort of timing loop. Uh, this is an option available to you. It's a little bit exploitive, right? This sort of airlocks always being able to open and close no matter what the pressures are around them and requiring no power to run. So some people will disagree with this on sort of moral ethical grounds, uh, but it is quite effective. And I actually really like this design. I think it's really clever. And even though it is very clearly an exploit, I think it's almost so clever that I'm tempted to use it in my bases as a result. Here we have a more traditional exploit for infinite storage of CO2, and that is simply that we've taken a gas vent and put a little bit of water over the gas vent. Basically, you can imagine that you set up this room, you put up a little bottle opener right here, and you dump a little bit of water into this room. Not much, again, because normal gas vents will overpressurize at two kilograms of pressure. So the water that you have down here is ultimately gonna have to be less than two kilograms per tile in order for this gas vent to continue being able to operate. But this basically relies upon a trick which is that uh, you can't have a liquid and a gas on the same tile. And so as a consequence, um, this CO2 is never going to displace this water that we have down here, right? 
And so this gas vent is perpetually going to see that it only has around one kilogram of pressure because that's how much water we have per tile down here. And so it's always gonna say, oh, I can, I can accept more gas, even though if we look at the pressure that we have up here, we've reached already around 34 kilograms per tile. So you can have a little infinite storage room for gases just by pulling a little bit of a water trick. There are other ways to pull this off as well. You don't need water all across the floor here, basically just across this gas vent. You can also do a little setup where you put this gas vent in a little pocket of hydrogen that was under one kilogram of hydrogen. And because the hydrogen is a lighter gas, it will rise up. Right, so instead of having this layer of water down here, we could have our gas vent right here and a little layer of hydrogen at the top, and the same thing would work. Um, all these are roughly the same efficiency, though. I don't think there's really much of a difference between them. And this is probably the simplest of them to set up, either with a bottle um oh, emptier, uh, just emptying a little bit of water under this area, or if you have a pipe full of water, you can just break one of the pipes and let it its contents leak on the floor and you'll be good to go for overpressurizing this room. Again, these two are kind of exploits. This is, I think, more what the game intends you to do, either storing it using the gas reservoirs or high pressure gas vents, or deleting the CO2 through carbon skimmers, oxy ferns, algae terrariums, or slicksters. That's it for this episode. I hope this has been helpful and keeping your base from looking uh, like this, or at least keeping it uh, looking like this and not like, say this. This is the situation you don't want to get into, where you have a bunch of oxygen producing technologies, but none of them can operate because of max gas pressure or something like that. Avoid this, use one of these, and you should be good to go. All right, that's it for this episode. I'll catch you guys next time.